Okay, we've already received a few questions and I'm sure there'll be uh, quite a few more uh, for our team of amyloidosis uh, amyloidologists to answer soon. Okay, and I do want to mention Dr. Havasi. She's, she's the only nephrologist on our panel today. She comes to us from Boston University and she's been a guest at several of our meetings. And then I mentioned Dr. Karam, who's a neurologist from Oregon Health and Science, better known as OHSU. And he's also been a guest at many meetings in Portland as well as in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Saji Kumar is one of our frequent guests at our local meetings. And he's a hematologist oncologist from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And we also have joining us today from the West Coast, uh, Dr. Jignesh Patel, the cardiologist at Cedars Sinai in Los Angeles. Um, he attends most of our Southern California meetings. And I have to confess, confess, when he made a presentation at our last LA meeting, I wanted to introduce him and say, the jig is up. That's bad, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Anyway, he's hearing that probably for the first time. Okay, now we're going to hear from Paula Schmidt, who's going to fill us in on news of any financial help available to our patients and the new website, One Amyloidosis Voice. Paula? Hi, everybody. I'm glad that you could join us today. I'm going to update you on some of the financial assistance programs that may be available to you as amyloidosis patients. And let's hope this one plays well. We'll see. As we all know, chemotherapy drugs are very expensive and depending on your insurance, you could have a large copay. On your screen, you will see several different charities that offer some form of financial assistance. I will post links to their websites in the chat window at the end of my presentation. These organizations may help with copays, travel costs, insurance premiums, diagnostic testing, or prescriptions. If you have AL and a blood cancer such as myeloma, lymphoma, or Waldenstrom's, you may be able to qualify for assistance due to your cancer diagnosis if they don't have a fund specific to amyloidosis. Eligibility requirements for many of these programs are dependent not only on your diagnosis, but on your financial status. So be sure to check the eligibility. Most require you to have a household income limit that is at or below the 500% threshold set by the U.S. Federal Poverty Guidelines. As you can see from the chart on your screen, the income limit goes up based on the number of people living in your household. Since these organizations are reliant on donations, they must on occasion close their programs to new applicants. But if you have been approved for assistance, you should continue to be covered for the time period or dollar amount of the grant you were initially awarded. To make it easier for you to know when a fund reopens, I suggest that you sign up for the Pan Foundation's new Fund Finder app. It's very quick to sign up and they will send you an alert via email or text when any amyloidosis related funds open back up. It eliminates the need for you to constantly check multiple websites for funding updates. If you are uninsured or underinsured, you should also check with the individual drug companies to see if they can offer you any assistance. Lastly, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Healthwell Foundation, and the PAN Foundation are offering $250 to $300 to any patient that has been diagnosed or exposed to COVID-19. On April 15th, NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, implemented its COVID-19 critical relief program, which will provide financial assistance to eligible patients covering up to $1,000 annually. This funding will provide patients with financial assistance that may be utilized to support critical non-medical needs due to the current crisis. Since all of these programs are set up differently, please contact each organization directly to see if you qualify. Their contact info will be posted in the chat box for easy access. I'm now going to change hats and talk to you about the One Amyloidosis Voice website. In early 2019, the ASG collaborated with Rare Life Solutions, 
to bring the world an excellent source of curated information on amyloidosis. When you go to oneamyloidosisvoice.com, you will see the registration page. You have the option to enter the main site from this page without joining, or to better protect your privacy, you can register and gain access to added features such as the social wall, where you can then chat with other members. On the home page that is currently shown on your screen, you will see different headings on the left-hand side. Click on the Trusted Resources tab, and you will see a host of options. There's a video library, a repository of scientific articles, current news, a list of upcoming events, blogs, links to social media sites, and the list goes on from there. People and Places is a personal favorite of mine because it takes you to a comprehensive listing of physicians, hospitals, and treatment centers. There are 165 physicians listed, and if you click on their name, you will see a more detailed profile. When you click on Places, you will find 75 different hospitals and treatment centers listed. Off to the right of this slide, I have placed a peak view of the detailed listing that you would see when you click on the name of the center or hospital. Diagnosis Educator is the final tab I am showing, and it is where you will find information about diagnosis, treatment, and support. As you have seen, One Amyloidosis Voice is a great resource for you to utilize, and I hope you take the time to look over the site yourself. Thanks for your attention today, and I look forward to getting back out on the road for our face-to-face -face support group meetings. Muriel? Thanks, Paula. Well, you know, we're learning as we're going. This is our first shot at this, and, you know, we, I, I picked a little bit at some of the chat comments. Okay. Now, I, I do want to mention a few more bios, okay? Dr. Maria Picken will be on our panel, and she's the world's number one amyloidosis pathologist. She authored by pathology and many of our meetings, and she also started a Chicago meeting at the hospital. I look forward to hearing her later. So if you have any pathology questions about diabetes and aberrant by her, she's our person there. Okay, so um, what's um, next, you ask? Okay, I will tell you. It's going to be Bob's turn. He's going to put on another hat, and he's going to give us an update on the amyloidosis registry. I don't know how many of you have uh, put input into the registry, but this is going to be very important. And Bob, you're going to tell us why. Thanks, Muriel. Let me pull up my slides as I begin here. Yes, I'm going to talk to you all uh, briefly about the amyloidosis registry, which is the latest initiative from uh, amyloidosis support groups, and which we really do hope that everybody uh, who is listening to this webinar now or we'll view it later, we'll, we'll go on and join and, and share their data. So let me get into it. Uh, so what you see here, hopefully on your screen share, is, is our logo for the patient registry. And when you do see this logo, uh, generally you'll be able to click on it and it will take you to uh, the registry itself. Many of you are just going to ask, well, really, what is a patient registry? It's fundamentally a secure and online database where patients can record their own data about their own experience with amyloidosis. Uh, we tend to refer to this type of a registry as a natural history registry because it contains patient-reported data, uh, not necessarily medically reported data from your physicians. When you join and you enter into the system, you will see a series of questionnaires. Questionnaires, or surveys as we sometimes call them, are gonna ask you about your symptoms, your diagnosis, the different tests and treatments you've received, your health, quality of life, demographics, and, and ancestry, um, which of course is, is probably a little bit more important for the hereditary forms of amyloidosis. The reason we're doing this, uh, there's multiple reasons really, but fundamentally what this registry will provide is a database for medical researchers to investigate amyloidosis in ways they haven't been able to do yet. 
Uh, we'll be able to better document patterns of disease progression. We'll certainly provide data uh, for researchers for their own particular field of research. Uh, it can also enable uh, people to be placed into clinical trials. You can get contacted through the registry for participation if your criteria meet the needs of the, uh, the trial. One of the things that we really think it might help with is identifying the best practices for self-care. So we can be sharing learnings that, that we've all had and how to handle the different situations that arise when uh, we're suffering from amyloidosis. And then lastly, and I know there's a huge focus on this now uh, from many of the advocacy groups and, and the physicians who are working on it, but trying to understand uh, the pathways to diagnosis. Uh, the more we can understand them, I think the, the better our opportunity will be to shorten them uh, and get earlier intervention where we need it most. So we're hosting the registry on the platform for engaging everyone responsibly. Uh, we call it PEER. Uh, one of the beauties of PEER is that the data that's within it is private and secure. And you all should be reassured of that given that this is an online data set. Um, everything is encrypted. PEER is already hosting about 32 other rare disease registries. They have a lot of experience in the field and they continue to make great improvements to the, the product. Uh, in fact, we are, and um, starting to enable two-factor authentication. Uh, and later this year, we'll have the opportunity to actually add uh, health records as well to the data set. So they're always improving it, and uh, we're, we're happy to, to look at their, their path for how this is going to help us all uh, as they get more capability. One of the real key things, though, is that you, the registrant, you control your own data, and you control who access it. You are always in, um, in charge of what's in the registry and who sees it. All, ident all, the, identif excuse me, <laughs> all the data in the registry is de-identified to researchers who access it. They can't see your personal information. Everything is aggregated up so it uh, applies to the broad set of data. But if they wanna contact you individually and find out more, they have to reach out through the registry itself and then you decide whether or not you wanna reveal any more information to that particular um, researcher. So again, you're just in control of your own data, uh, which we think is the right way for these to work. And then lastly, amyloidosis support groups is, is running this and the registry managers and anyone else from our team who accesses the registry has been certified in protecting human research participants. And of course, we also have to go through IRB board approvals to make sure that we're compliant with the, the right uh, ethical responsibilities that we have and running the registry. So this is actually a little bit dated at this point. We have over 350 participants right now. Um, and the quick breakup from earlier this year was AL, the vast majority, 54%. You can hopefully see that even with some of the issues we're having and displaying of, of detail here. But at the bottom of your page, that large red bar runs up to 54%. But we have a good mix of hereditary and wild type uh, as well, localized, uh, and other, including other types of hereditary and AAA. Um, and other forms of amyloidosis. We really want to keep this growing. 300 is, may seem large, but it's a small number. We want to get this up in the multiple thousands over time. And so you can ask yourself, well, how can I join and contribute? It's very simple. You can go to the amyloidosis support groups website. And if you go to the homepage, you'll see our logo right there on the left-hand bar. And you click on that, it'll bring you directly to the registry page. Otherwise, you can just go to amyloidosissupport.org and backslash registry. Once you're on the page, we have a little bit of information for you to read. We have a little section for helpful hints in registering. But most importantly, at the end of the arrow here, you click register now, and then you'll be able to sign in and start to contribute your data. So please, please do that. And then lastly, as I mentioned, amyloidosis support group is, is fully behind the registry. We're running it. In fact, Paula Schmidt, our executive director, who you just heard from, is also our fabulous patient registry manager. If you have any questions, you need any help, you can contact her through this email, registry at amyloidosissupport.org. So, so that's it. Again, uh, really do encourage everybody who's listening in right now to sign up and contribute your data to this project. We think it's gonna be immensely valuable going forward. 
with that, let me send it back to you, Muriel. Thanks so much, Bob. You know, I, I, Bob, I, I want to ask you a question. I, when I have to fill out a lot of data, I have a tendency to do it, then I get interrupted, I leave, and I come back. Is that something where we, we can do that when we fill it out? Can we leave it and come back another day or whatever? Yes, yes, the answer is absolutely. You don't have to fill out all the information at once. In fact, we're asking for a lot of information over time and we'll periodically send out other uh, questionnaires and, and surveys for you to continue to track the data. So you can go in and you can sign up and add initial information, then go back into it later and add more um, until you're eventually, and not, not too long, but eventually you're through all the surveys that we currently have up there. Um, so yes, take your time, but do participate. Great. And thank you so much. And, and another thing I want to mention, you know, I really enjoyed Dr. Landau's presentation. And I think one of the most hopeful things that comes of it is there's such a nice large group of treatments in the arsenal. Granted, they're not approved for AL amyloidosis, they're approved for multiple myeloma, but we're using them in amyloidosis. And I think that that gives everyone a little bit of, you know, security knowing that it, should the shoe drop and something isn't working, we've got something else to go on. Um, I do want to introduce um, a few more people that are going to be on our panelists. One is Dr. Kara Rosenbaum, who's the amyloidosis uh, hematologist at Weill Cornell in New York City and hosts our meetings at that hospital. She's been a guest at many of our meetings. She was at the University of Chicago Hospital prior to that and had been a guest at many of our Chicago meetings as well. Okay, now... Mary O'Donnell couldn't join us today from the Amyloidosis Foundation, so I'm going to be sort of a sub Mary O'Donnell, okay? Except I'm not tall and blonde and beautiful, but we'll try. Okay, uh, she did send a few slides, however. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, Amyloidosis Foundation, um, it was started by Mary and her late husband, Don Brockman, in 2004. They provide research and travel grants. Uh, to, to young investigators. They do grand rounds at many hospitals. If you have a grand round that you'd like done at your local hospital, you would contact Mary about that. And you may have attended one or more of their great webinars over the years. So they're pretty wonderful. Um, I, I guess we didn't have any slides about that, huh? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, folks, we didn't have that. But maybe we'll get some for, you know, a future um, presentation, or maybe Mary will be able, be able to join us. Um, now it's going to be Ark's turn. So um, we're going to hear from Isabel Lusada from the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. Um, are we ready to go with Isabel? Great. Okay. Thank you so much. It's really um, an honor to participate in this meeting today and um, such an important time for everybody. So thank you to the Amyloidosis Support Group for hosting this virtual meeting. I'm going to share some slides. Um, so hopefully you can all see these slides. Um, I want to mainly focus on and highlight some areas that the Amyloidosis Research Consortium is doing in response to the COVID crisis. But by way of background, I'll tell you a little bit about um, ARC and what we do. The Amyloidosis Research Consortium ARC was, the mission is to accelerate the development of and access to new and innovative treatments for systemic amyloidosis and improve quality of life for patients, which is really the bottom line. The model that we have that we use for the consortium is a consortium model, which really is about building collaborations, leveraging the strengths and resources that different stakeholder groups who have vested in amyloidosis have. Our partnerships include with patients and patient organizations like ASG, with researchers and clinicians, with the pharma companies that are involved in doing research and developing treatments, with payers and with regulatory bodies. The organization was founded in 2015. We held, the initial meeting we held was actually a patient-focused drug development. And that really highlighted what the unmet need in, is for patients with amyloidosis. What do they want and where do we need to do more work? 
And since then, we have had numerous meetings develop tools and guidelines that have really focused on developing and accelerating much needed treatments on a primary basis. We have actually in 2019, I won't go into details of what's on this slide, but in 2019, we developed a partnership, public-private partnership with FDA to really accelerate the process of getting new drugs approved for amyloidosis. And with that comes quality of life. Um, and as part of quality of life, we also have a number of tools and programs that we develop at ARC to really support patients through this journey, through clinical research, but also in their everyday life. I'm now gonna focus a little bit on what we're doing as part of the COVID-19 response. First of all, we've developed some really great resources on our website. The website is www.arci.org. We have the latest up-to-date information on everything about how patients can best look after themselves, the do's and don'ts from taking part in clinical trials to everyday shopping, to what you should do about taking medications or not, particularly amyloid specific ones. We also have resources for physicians and we have on there the latest guidelines on different treatments that what should be being done during this time. So I do urge you to go there. We're updating it daily, if not um, hourly. So as any changes come in, there's also policy around um, payers and Medicare and different benefits that are changing all the time. And we're advocating along with ASG to make sure that as we go to more remote visits that these are covered for all patients to have the treatment that they most need. I want to talk a little bit about um, the myamyloidosis pathfinder tool. This is a tool that we initially developed to help patients find and um, assess different treatment centers, to compare different treatment centers, to decide where, what best meets their needs. And it also identifies clinical trials that match patients and will highlight you as any new trials come available that might match you. As part of this, we've also developed a tool called My Appointment Companion. This tool is really helpful for use in telehealth visits. Many of the amyloidosis centers actually use this tool now as part of their routine visits and care. So many of you may already have seen this. If you go to our website, the myamyloidosispathfinder, one word, dot com, you will find this tool. And what it does is it helps you define what are your concerns, changes in health, what medications you're currently taking, not just your amyloid specific ones, but any other medications what your priorities might be. And you can share this seamlessly. There's a, just a click through to share this with your physician ahead of the visit, or you can take it with you to the visit. Telehealth visits tend to be quite complex in that you have to know how to use the remote, whether you're using FaceTime, Zoom, or what meeting. So being well prepared for that. It can cut into the time of your visit. So this can really help you and your physician make the most out of these visits. And during such a stressful time, I really urge you to consider using a tool like this to support you in your care. We are here, our team of um, experts at Amyloidosis Research Consortium are here to support patients and help you through your journey. Please feel free to reach out to us at any point through our website, www.archi.org, or our phone line is 617-467-5170, or you can email, email us at arc at archie.org. And we're really here, as is the amyloidosis support group, to work together to help you to ensure that we all get through this as best we can. Thank you again um, for inviting me here and I really would welcome working with you and supporting, supporting the community as best we can. Thank you so much, Isabel. I just love her accent. Oh, wow. A little bit of class this morning, right? Well, morning here in Chicago, but I guess it's not morning everywhere. Okay, uh, I, I do want to mention a few more of our doctors that are going to be on our panel. Uh, Dr. Vishali is, uh, come, it heads up the uh, Boston University Amyloidosis Center. She's the director. I first met her back in 2004. She was overseeing stem cell transplants back then, and uh, here she is heading up the center now, and she's a frequent guest at many of our meetings. 
And Dr. Brett Sperry is an amyloid cardiologist at St. Luke's in Kansas City. And he, his group co-hosts our Kansas City meetings. And he's been a guest at several meetings in the last uh, year. So uh, we'll, we'll get to more later, OK? But uh, now it is time to hear from Mackenzie Boddicker of Mackenzie's Mission. Uh, we love what they're doing on the Amer awareness front. So Mackenzie, take it away. Thank you, Muriel, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Mackenzie. I was diagnosed with AL amyloidosis back in 2017, and I am the founder of Mackenzie's Mission. I'm here today to speak to you a little bit about our Raising Awareness Initiative, the Amyloidosis Speakers Bureau. Okay. So. Our mission at the Amyloidosis Speakers Bureau is to educate specifically the medical, the medical community about amyloidosis through patient stories, which we believe will contribute to earlier diagnosis and ultimately improved patient survival. Our vision is a world where amyloidosis is a widely recognized disease in the medical community, where identification and diagnostic methods are established and integrated into the mainstream protocols and diagnosis happens early on. Ideally, there is no need for a Speakers Bureau. The challenges we face are ones that you all are all too familiar with. We know that amyloidosis is a rare and a very complex disease. And as a result, there's a widespread lack of awareness within the medical community. Amyloidosis experts actually believe that this disease is frequently mis- and underdiagnosed. You all know, and it's incredibly frustrating, but it can take years and multiple doctors to finally reach a correct diagnosis. All the while, gold standard treatments no longer are available to us as patients, treatments start too late, and unfortunately, there's a high mortality rate associated with this disease. So what are we at the Amyloidosis Speakers do Bureau doing about it? Well, we're sending patient speakers to visit medical schools across the U.S. Our speakers share their journey and their experience with amyloidosis. And in addition, we send an educational library with scientific papers and information curated by amyloidosis experts. So ultimately, we're raising awareness to thousands of future doctors who in turn will see countless patients over the course of their career. We want to aim for earlier detection and better survival rates with our work. So we chose to speak specifically to second year medical students, and that was for two reasons. The first is that the second year medical school curriculum is typically the point in medical training where there's an introduction to diseases. You're finally now talking about diseases and rather than just normal human body functioning. So this makes it a very appropriate time to be speaking to students about amyloidosis. We often hear from them that amyloidosis is something that's not readily talked about and not very thoroughly covered in their training. They may only get a paragraph or two about amyloidosis, and that's just not enough. The second reason why we chose second year medical students is because students have yet to declare their specialty yet, right? And with a multi-systemic disease like amyloidosis, this can be very beneficial. As a patient first developing symptoms, you could see a variety of different doctors, right? If the first symptom you develop is cardiac related, you'll go and see a cardiologist. If it's kidney related, you'll go and see a nephrologist and so on and so forth. This isn't just a disease where the first doctor you'll see is a hematologist. So all of these different specialists need to be familiar with this disease. And the great thing about speaking to second year medical students is we've got all these future specialists in a room together. Our potential annual impact is huge. There's approximately 170 medical schools in the US, and on average, there's around 150 medical students per class. So the pipeline of future doctors coming every year is over 25,000. So in our first year of operation, the 2019-2020 school year, over 9,000 students have received our information, and we've given 41 either in-person or virtual presentations. And at the Speakers Bureau, we average anywhere from about 35 to 45 patient speakers. 
And while the numbers are important, that's not the best way for us to judge and reflect on what we're doing. The best way for us to receive feedback and learn how we can improve is through patient, excuse me, is from medical student testimonials. So I know this slide is a bit dense, but we have um, a couple different testimonials. I'll read for you just the middle one from Rachel Miller. She's a medical student at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Rockford. And she said, amyloidosis is something we often call a zebra disease. Its presentation is odd and confusing and its treatments few. Since AL is most treatable early, keeping it in your differential is so important. Having the ASB talk at my school reinforce that idea. I believe I will be a better physician for having attended this lecture. And countless other students like Rachel are helping us to learn and improve as we continue to give more presentations. And it's exciting because not only are these medical students energized and see value in what we're doing, but so are other physicians. Dr. Gordon Huggins is a cardiologist and a professor at the Tufts University School of Medicine. He was instrumental in the inception of the idea of the ASB, and he says that the ASB has the potential to significantly alter the course of this disease. So it's really exciting for us that, that physicians and medical students are seeing value in what we're doing. So thank you very much for listening. If you wanna learn more, please do visit our website at the link below. And if you have any questions or you're interested in becoming a speaker, feel free to email us. Thank you. Um, well, thank you everyone for listening to my presentation. Thank you again, Muriel, for having me. I really appreciate all the work you're doing for us patients. Thank you so much. So much, Mackenzie. You know, Mackenzie was one of the youngest uh, people that I, I knew that was diagnosed with AL systemic amyloidosis. I believe she was 21 when she was diagnosed. And she and her mom became very active advocates soon after the diagnosis. And look, look what they've been doing now with the help of Charlotte Raymond. So it's pretty exciting. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take that short break that we talked about and we'll resume in 10 minutes. Okay, 